we're so glad you chose to join us for today's message. We know beyond the shadow of a doubt, it's going to transform your life. So leave us a comment. We need to know what God's doing for you in your life. We want to celebrate that with you. Of course, you can always join us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11. We'd love to meet you. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. Everybody say praise the Lord. Everybody say praise the Lord. Stand to your feet and say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's give the Lord a big hand clap of praise right now. Let everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Hallelujah. Anybody breathing here today? That means you praise God. Praise Him in the morning. Praise Him at noon time. Praise Him when the sun goes down. Let everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. One more time. Let's praise Him. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. The Lord bless you. You may be seated. Pastor Michael called me yesterday afternoon and said, Dad, I can't go. I need you to preach in the morning. So if what I do is about to drop off the face of the earth, it's because I didn't have enough time to do it right. I want us to pray for our pastor and his wife. They're both very sick. Somebody said, is it the COVID? No, it's not the COVID. Quit giving the COVID any credit for anything. Amen. 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 There's just such a thing as bad colds, sore throats, and coughing. Anybody has seen this coughing demon lately? Oh, yeah. While I'm preaching this morning, he'll, try, he'll probably try to come up here and start it again. But he's a liar. He's a liar, father of all lies. Praise God. We're going to press through. Everybody say amen. amen. Praise God. I want to bring your attention today to the word of the Lord, Exodus 14. Before we go there, I want you to read Hebrews 11, 21 with me. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, worshipped, 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 leaning on the top of his staff. I want to speak to you for a few minutes this morning on the making of a worshiper. The making of a worshiper. Exodus chapter 14 describes an incredible moment in Israel's history. The Israelites had been led into a valley that was surrounded on both sides by mountains and in front of them was an impassable, impossible wall called the Red Sea. They had found themselves there, being led there by Moses. They didn't realize it, but these people were about to experience the darkest, stormiest night of their lives. I'm sure that you're aware that most believers understand this chapter in Israel's history, we know how, what happened at the Red Sea and how God miraculously opened that Red Sea and they walked across on dry ground. So you're wondering, what does this have to do with the making of a worshiper? What does this have anything to do with worship? I believe this passage of Scripture has everything to do with the making of a worshiper. This incident has everything to do with the making of a worshiper. You see, God wants His people to worship Him in the good times and in the bad times. May I simply tell you this, that worshipers are not made during the time of revival. Worshipers are not created in the good times, the sunny times, the rainbow and the clouds time, in the times of wealth, in the times of prosperity. No, worshipers are made when they see the enemy running. Worshipers are made during that dark, stormy night 
when they feel all alone and they wonder what is on the horizon for tomorrow, worshipers are going to be made in the middle of the storm. Anybody can shout when you got money in your pocket. Anybody can shout when you got a nice car to drive. Anybody can shout when you put on good-looking clothes and strut yourself down the street. Anybody can feel good about themselves. And do Anybody can come to church saying, Wahoo! But those times when you come while you're in the storm, those times when it does not look good for you at all, and you find yourself having to force your hand to get up, having to force the other hand to get up, then you have to force them to straighten up. Then you have to force them to lift up. You have to make it happen. You're not in the time of revival, but you're in the time of a storm. And in the time of the storm, that is where God is going to make a true worshiper. Amen. Hebrews 11th chapter gives us an image of Jacob in his old age. The Bible said that by faith, Jacob... When he was dying, he blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on his staff. At his weakest hour, old age was there. It looked like everything was over. Jacob leaned on that staff and began to worship God. We know that in the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11th chapter, we know that Jacob is just one of many figures that's listed there. But here is a man who had been through storm after another storm. He and his family had endured a traumatic, traumatic events at every stage in their life. And Jacob himself had been through much personal hurt, pain, and sorrow in the earlier years of his life on earth. Jacob knew his life was about over, about to end. And that's why we see him giving his blessings to his grandchildren, the sons of Joseph. So what does Joseph, or what does Jacob do as he looks back at the events of his life? Not a word is spoken by the man. Only the scripture said he leaned on that staff that had comforted him, that had been with him, that had fought many a battle with him, that had seen incredible miraculous things with him, he leaned on that staff and began to worship God. May I tell you, it's not how loud you worship. It is the intensity of your heart's worship toward the Lord. It's not how much racket, and I love racket and praise unto God, but your heart's got to be into it, or it's nothing but just that, racket. When you begin to worship God <coughs> with everything that's in you, it changes things. What looks bad begins to look better. What looks horrible begins to look good. When you begin to worship God in the middle of your trial, Jacob probably replayed all the victories that God had given him through his lifetime. And he knew that God had been so good to him. That's why he thought him, I could just still praise the Lord. Praise the mighty God. Oh, mighty God, I worship you. How many know without any doubt you would not be on these pews this morning if God had not been good to you? If you believe that, I want you to clap your hands and... <coughs> Make that joyful noise unto the Lord. My message today that I want to speak to you about, and I feel God would have me to speak to many souls in this place, but I'm speaking today to people who are facing the most difficult time of their lives. It's meant for those people who are seeing their present trial as a dark stormy night you are in the merest middle of severe testing in fact your trial may be so impossible that it is going to take a miraculous intervention from God but I want to show you today through this message that God is going to be with you 
not just to go in the storm, but he'll take you through the storm and you'll be worshiping on the other side of the storm. Somebody shout amen. You see, there's a way in your darkest night that he plans to bring for you, bring you out as a shining example of his incredible faithfulness to his people. Let me tell you something. We may not have been faithful, but God has always been faithful. And God does not bless you because of how good you are. He blesses you because how good he is. It's not about your righteousness. It's about his righteousness. It's not about your holiness. It's about his holiness. It's not how much you've done for God, but how much has God done for you. That's what puts worship. That's what brings worship. Somebody shout amen. <coughs> I go back to the 14th chapter of Exodus. And notice that the Lord put Israel in their impossible situation. Who put them there? We blame the devil for everybody. But the Bible tells me that the Lord put them in their impossible situation. Understand it was God that led them to the Red Sea. It was God that delivered them from Egypt. But it was God that took them right to that place of absolutely nowhere else to go. God put them in that position. And on top of that, the Bible said that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God made Pharaoh even more angry than he should have been. God did that. The devil didn't do it, but God did it. I want us to quit giving so much credit to the devil. There's some things God's going to allow in your life and they are there for divine purpose and divine reason. You just keep your hands lifted and your voice is lifted and I promise you God's going to take you through. Somebody shout amen with me. <clears throat> God wanted his people to enter into the future and to a wilderness journey as worshipers at worshipers. God does not want complainers. He's not interested in murmurers. Anybody can complain. Anybody can murmur. Anybody can gossip. Anybody can find this wrong and that wrong and the other wrong. Anybody can do that, but that's, what, no, that's not what God is wanting. God is wanting true worshipers. True worshipers. You're not in this place today because you think you're special. You're here because he's special. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah, we're special. We're his kids. But the most special thing about you is the God you serve. Without him, I'm not anything. I'll tell you that right now. The Lord says, I am going to honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host in the fourth verse, and the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Now, this is just going a little bit too far. Here people have been beaten, whipped, scourged for 400 years. God has led them out through a divine miracle after miracle after miracle that happened in Egypt. And now they're on their way and they are some kind of excited about this. And God says, <laughs> I'm going to put you in front of the Red Sea. I'm going to put mountains on either side of you. Have fun, kids. And then to make it a little bit bigger, I'm going to harden the heart of Pharaoh. Your enemy is going to have a desire like he's never had to destroy you. But I want you to know the reason I'm doing this is that I am going to make you a worshiper. You're going to find out how good I am. You're going to find out how big I am. You're going to find out what the miraculous power I have. I'm going to make you a worshiper, and I can't do that if I don't put you through some rough times. Israel encamped by the sea. God told Moses to lead them there. The people had put up their tents. 
They're rejoicing. Oh, it's so good. We are free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we're free at last. Everybody was singing the song. Everything is great. We're building little campfires right outside the door of our tent. Our kids are dancing out in the middle of nowhere, having a good time. It is an incredible time. They were full of hope. They were singing. They were crying, tears running down their cheeks. No more pain, no more sorrow. Oh, we're going to the promised land. Oh, look what God is going to do for us. A new day, a promised land, all waiting for them to enter in. And that scene so very clearly shows us the passage of a firstborn child of God. When you first give your heart and your life to God, you are on cloud nine. Everybody's talking in tongues. Everybody's blessing you like you ain't never been blessed. You can just think blessing, and here comes the blessing. It's the most wonderful life you've ever. You pulled up to a gas station, and somebody puts gas in your car. It's the most incredible life you've ever seen. You got up in the morning, went to your closet, and there was brand new clothes sitting up there for you. I'm you it's a great life when you first find God and you give your heart and your life to him and you feel with his spirit. And you sit in your tent and you're so happy. Oh, you're happy. But Y'all know where I'm going with this, don't you? You know exactly where I'm going with this. But it ain't going to be like that always. Enjoy the mountain because there's a valley on the other side. Enjoy the high time experience because you're going to face reality real quick. If you think for one minute that the devil is going to release you and let you do anything in the kingdom of God without a battle and a fight, oh, have I got news for you. The devil hates you. He loathes you. He despises you. And anything he can put on you that'll get your eyes off of where you're going and get your eyes not looking up but looking out, you, that's his desire. That's what he wants to do. Oh, they're fixing their little tents. They're excited. Wonderful place of salvation. Oh, God is fulfilling every promise that he said. Our grandchildren have been blessed. Oh, we're so blessed. We're so blessed. Oh, we're going into the promised land. And yet at their greatest moment of peace, the enemy sought to devour them. At the height of Israel's freedom, during their hour of greatest hope and excitement, the attack came. The Egyptians literally came roaring down on them, coming under the direction of Pharaoh himself, just like a lion. That demonic army was clearly bent on taking every one of them back into slavery. The Egyptians pursuing them, all the horses, all the chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, they overtook them as they were encamping by the sea. Can you imagine the sound of the rumbling of the chariot wheels as they're realizing something is happening? We thought we left all this behind, but what do we hear? It got so bad that they sent some of the elders to the top of the ridge, and when he looked out, he saw nothing but a cloud of dust, thousands of infantrymen behind thousands of warriors, they said it was on 900 chariots was lined up across there making their way to destroy and bring back those Israelites. Let me tell you something. When the devil wants to take you down, he's going to bring everything he's got. He's going to bring everything he's got. But I also want to tell you today, your God is bigger than anything he can throw against you. Your God is greater than any devil that can raise up his head against you. Your God is greater than any sickness you may be having right now. Your God is greater than anything that's ever gone wrong in your life. Your God is greater. I want you to shout it out. My God is greater. He will deliver me. My God is greater. He will deliver me. 
clap those hands and worship him again right now. Hallelujah. <coughs> you see, it's in the time when the Egyptians were marching out after them and the Bible said that they were sore afraid in verse 10. Sore afraid. I've been afraid in my lifetime. I don't know if I've ever been sore afraid. Sore afraid is a pretty good state of being afraid. They were so afraid that their bodies were literally sore inside out. Their nerves were frayed. Their vision was impaired. Their hearing was muffled. Their speech was muffled. Everything, they were sore afraid. I have seen the devil speak words into people's life. You're going to lose your job. Oh, God, what? You're going to lose your marriage. No, 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 no. You're going to die with cancer. No, 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 no. You're going to have this happen to you. You're going to have that happen to you. The devil loves to speak those words to you. And he loves to stay on you, realizing that if he can just get you to be fearful enough, he can move in your life and take over everything there is to take over about you. His key element is making you fearful. Oh, if he can just lift you living in fear. It was this kind of shocking call that Israel received. The Bible said in the 10th verse, they lifted up their eyes, beheld the Egyptians, they were sore afraid, sore afraid. Their cry was, we're trapped, it's hopeless, we're helpless, we are going to die. The Bible said that the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And let me tell you something, this was not a cry of, to God for help. This was a, oh, <laughs> Oh, my God, my God, hast thou forsaken us? Oh, they cried, cried out to God. Oh, my God, how bad can it get? You let us here to let them come in and just, oh, my God. You filled us with hope. You delivered us. You said we're going into a promised land. But for what? To end up dying at Pharaoh's hand? being hogtied and taken back into Egypt, all our pain and our suffering is for naught, and this is where we end up. You filled us with hope. You gave us great promises. You let the enemy come down on us. It was better for us if we were back in Egypt. Isn't it amazing how we can be shouting one minute and the next minute blaming God for our problems? I would ask you, have you ever felt that way? Sure you have. Don't give me all your religious stuff. I know for a fact you have. We've all felt like that. There have been times we have sat back and said, God, what did you do this for? Of what good purpose is going to come out of this? Now, it's going to be great when they come in here and take us back, worse shape than when we left. Our old homes are burned down. Everything's gone that we've put back in storage. It's all taken. Oh, that's going to be great, God. And it's all your fault. Can't believe you brought us this far just to leave us. I can't believe it. What did I do, oh God, to deserve this? You see, when you start asking God why, that is the beginning of becoming a whiner. Whine, why, whiner, whine, whiner, why, why, oh God, I am whining, oh God, why, oh God, did you do this, why, oh, I'm whining, Jesus, would you please tell me just why? What did I do to deserve this? I, I, I heard, I've heard that so much. The 
people have a problem in their life, they always say, what did I do for God to do this to me? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Y'all know I'm telling you the truth, whether you like it or not. You know what I mean? I've done my best to serve your word. I've done my best to do everything you told me to do, and you putting all this on me? Hello, God. I'm whining. Don't you hear me? Why would you treat me this way? Lord, the pain I see ahead is worse than the pain I left. Oh, God, what do you do with this? In the midst of their trial, God gave them a three-point message. The first thing that he told them was, fear not. But, 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 I don't know. We don't want much buts. He said, fear not. You can't do anything about it anyhow. So why are you wrapped up in fear and you're shaking and your mind is tormented and you can't get it all together because you're wrestling with this thing? But the word said, fear not. Oh, that's a big command. How many of you folks could say you've never feared? Well, this is a house full of honest people. Then he tells them, stand still. And to be honest with you, for some of us, this is harder than this. First sign of trouble, God's moving me somewhere. And all of a sudden, you get all religious and you're having seasons in your life. And God's finished with this season and he's moving into that season and oh, I just got to go because something's happening and it ain't right right here. It's right because God put you there and he said, fear not, stand still. Quit running around like a chicken with your head cut off. I'll never forget the first time I saw that. My father, during hard times, decided he was going to get some chickens and we was going to raise them and cook them and eat them. And the thing that went on before that was just mind-boggling. He took that poor little old chicken, ran pop, and I'm just a kid. What? I was so thankful I wasn't that chicken right then. I just said, God. And that poor chicken without a head is now running all over the barnyard. That's where the phrase come out, like a chicken with your head cut off. And they can run around forever. And they're not silent. Their wings are beating. They're trying to find their head. God said, be still. Turn to your neighbor and say, quit wiggling. <laughs> Have you ever sat beside a child in church? <laughs> I raised three of them. I know all about that. Your pastor was a lead kid. Be still. I had an aunt that sat behind me in church, and she had an amazing power in the distance between the forefinger and the thumb. And she had the ability to reach across that pew. When I was busy writing during church, of course, now they just play video games, you know, you know right in church. When my mind wasn't listening to what the pastor had to say, and I was, I'd reach over and talk to my buddy, all of a sudden, Aunt Betty Jo, she's 95 years old today, probably watching this broadcast on that. <laughs> she would reach across that pew, grab this little fleshy part called the earlobe, 
I never knew that had feeling in it until Betty Joe got a hold of it. Twist it. And friend, I stopped. Ooh. I got to thinking if she does that on this side, I am in one big mess. Be still. Be still. I pastored people and had to use a restroom four or five times a service. Be still. Be still. Just had to get a drink. Be still. Drink before church. Be still. Be still. Some of us are so encouraged by just wanting to run and do this that we're not sitting still where we can hear the voice of God. Anybody with me here right now? Anybody with me right now? God was telling them, you stand still. Why? So you can see the salvation of the Lord. You don't fear. You stand still because you are about to see the salvation of the Lord. If you don't do the first two things, you're not going to see the third thing. Don't look for this until you do this and this. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Don't ask God for a miracle if you've got fear controlling your life. Fear not. God's bigger than your sickness. He's bigger than your condition. He's bigger than your problem. He's bigger than any obstacle you'll ever face. He's God beside him. There is no other. Fear not. Stand still. Quit running. Oh, oh let me call. Oh, my favorite prayer partner. Oh, they'll pray with me. Oh, hello. Susie, I'm so glad you're there. Oh, Susie, I need prayer. I just need prayer. I really don't want to talk about it. I just need prayer. God have mercy. He's telling them you're going to see the miraculous power of God if you'll fear not, stand still. Hard things to do, but I can guarantee you the miracle of God if you'll just fear not and stand still and let the Lord fight your battle. You see, right now, God is doing a work in the supernatural. Outside the confines of this building, there are angels and demons on the roof warring over your soul. If it were not for the beautiful presence of God we feel in here, they'd be in here warring over your soul. But they're outside, they're in the atmosphere. They're everywhere you look. They're above the Chinese balloon. They're everywhere. <laughs> fighting for your soul. They're looking for your soul. They're fighting for They want to possess your soul. They want to take control of you. They can't stand it when you walk into the house of God, lift your hands and begin to praise God. It upsets all of hell when you're going through hell and yet you come into the house of God and you lift your hands and you begin to praise God. Oh, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I'm going to praise him in the morning, praise him in the evening, praise him when the sun goes down. I'm going to praise him. I'm going to praise him. See, soon dust fell over that camp. And I know I'm going over to David, and I don't get to do this about twice a year, so just hang with me, buddy. <laughs> soon dust fell over the camp. It was the beginning of Israel's dark and stormy night. It was also the beginning of God's supernatural work. When nighttime comes on, When the sun goes down on you and there's nothing but blackness, when you get a bad report from the doctor,
Mary Ann, I'm so glad to see you in church today. I am. Cancer had ravaged her body, but God's still giving her victory day by day by day by day by day by day. Walking in it, walking. Just keep walking in it, Mary Ann. Walking in it, baby. Walking in it. It wasn't all that God did while he was out there and supernaturally just having the warrior with his angels fighting the demons of hell. But the Lord also knew a supernatural cloud that he had given to Israel for guidance. They had followed that cloud and noticing that was the voice and the will of God until he parked that, that cloud parked them in the middle of those two mountain ranges and a, a, dead, a Red Sea. And then all of a sudden they might have had second thoughts about that cloud. What is this? But as the enemy was coming up on the backside, that cloud all of a sudden moved. And Moses said, As darkness moves in your life, don't get excited. Don't, don't question God. Let God take care of his business. That cloud moves from the front of that encampment all the way around, 180 degrees, and sets between the enemy and Israel. The people of God stood outside their tents and were looking, and they were seeing a light show like they'd never seen before. The sun was shining. Everything was beautiful. Stars are going to come out. Everything was lovely. But those Egyptians on the backside that that cloud had come over them, they couldn't see a foot in front of their face. It was a cloud so dark it was nothing but the midnight hour on them. Don't question the cloud that God's put in your life. Just Hallelujah. Let me tell you something. If you're a blood-bought child of God, he has put a warrior between you and the enemy. That warrior stands there to ward off anything that's coming against you. Fear not. Stand still. Believe in my salvation. Satan may come against you breathing horrible, evil, horrible things, breathing evil threats against you, but at no time during that dark, stormy night is the enemy ever able to destroy you as long as you fear not and stand still. I want you to think about that for a minute. How many of you folks have ever had a dark cloud in your life? I see hands all over this building. That's the honest ones. We've all had them. We've all sat down and said, God, what you doing? Even those Pharaoh's army was in the total darkness. They pulled the second stunt. They began to raise their voices and began to scream at the Israelites on the other side of that mountain. We're coming after you. Might be a cloud between us, but sooner or later we're going to get you. You're going to be destroyed. What's not destroyed, we're going to drag back to Egypt with us. I'm telling you, we're coming. Even though a cloud was on the enemy, they still, when they couldn't even see nothing, was still cursing the Israelites. I'm telling you, the devil hates God's people. If you're a blood-bought child of God, he, the devil hates you. Oh, he hates you. You've heard voices on the other side of darkness, the enemy of your soul pounded your ears all night long. Israel's tents literally shook from that barrage of verbal onslaught. But it didn't matter how the enemy treated them. There was an angel on guard to protect them. And God has made his people a promise. He had already told them, I'm going to bring you through. We're going through. Why did God allow Israel to go through an entire stormy night when he could have just simply spoke the words 
and it will all go away. You see, when they looked out there and the breath of God, and notice that, that Israel was traveling east to west. And the Bible said an eastern wind come in. In other words, it was blowing toward the east. It became right over the house, right over the tents of Israel. The wind blew right over where they were in camp. It blew over the cloud that had them blinded by the enemy, blinded behind them, and it moved into the Red Sea. Israel had to put up with the wind, not realizing the purpose of the wind. But the purpose of the wind was not just to cause destruction, but it was to open a path in the middle of the thing that you thought was impossible. God exhaled all night long. We used to sing the old chorus, let it breathe on me. Let it breathe on me. Let the joy of the Lord now breathe on me. You ever heard that old song? You knew you come, you this new generation don't know anything about all that. <laughs> Just the breath of God. And Moses stands out with his rod. We're going across, guys. And they begin to walk across on dry ground. As the water was literally stood up on both sides like two Niagara Falls on either side of them. Now, you may say, ooh, that had to be a miracle. It was. But I'm going to tell you a bigger miracle as far as I'm concerned. Was walking in between two walls of water and not wondering, you know, when, when is this going to end? When is this wall going to collapse here? When is this blessing going to be over? Are you hearing what I'm saying now? But they stayed in the middle of the Dead Sea Wall, and nobody even worried about the wall of water. They were looking at the promised land. They're looking at what's ahead. Can't worry about what's standing up on each side. No. God has got everything under control. Don't look to your left. Don't look to your right, but keep your eyes fixed on him. Don't look to your left, don't look to your right, but keep your eyes fixed on him. Don't look left, don't look right, keep your eyes fixed on him. The miracle that he's given you, you may think it's going to stop while you're in the big middle of it. No, he's not going to stop working the miraculous in you until he gets you to the other side. That's his purpose and his plan since the foundation of the world. See, when you get discouraged, it's hard to be a worshiper. You can be a praiser, and that's a good thing. But a worshiper goes from here to here. And all of a sudden, the heart now is controlling what these do. Whether it's clapping. You know yourself, there's times when you clap under the anointing. And there's times you clap just to be clapped. There's times you shout hallelujah when you feel it. And there's times you say hallelujah. And you'll even let somebody that's getting a blessing right down the road from you. They're getting it all together and you're sitting over there with envy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're going to have their time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Won't be long now. Oh, I've been there. I've done that. Yes, sir. It's coming. It's coming. Ain't got time for that, folks. Whether you believe it or not, Jesus is coming soon. He's coming back very soon. I cannot give you any promise about the economy of the world. It's going to collapse before long. I can't tell you that. 
I can't give you a promise of China not sending bombs our way and Russia getting all excited. I can't give you a promise that that's not going to happen. We're living in the last days of the last days. It's getting something big getting ready to happen. Too many signs on the horizon. Too many things are saying 666 is getting ready for the turn of the Antichrist, for him to set up his kingdom. But before that happens, we're going to get out of here. So I'm going to tell you something. When you start seeing all these things line up in front of you and you think you can't make it, no. Instead of being the bunch that stayed in the tent, you see, they were in the tent going, oh, God, you're about to blow my tent away. While the people that got out of the tent looked and they saw the brightness of the sun, the beauty of the day. I want to encourage you, don't sit in a tent when you're supposed to be outside magnifying your God. Don't do it. Don't do it. Well, Brother Kelly, how do you... How do you get that, you know, that where you can really worship him? Well, the way I do it is I start reminding myself, look what the Lord has done. Look what the Lord has done. He's healed my body. He's touched my mind. Anybody with me right now? Just look what the Lord has done. Praise team, get yourself on this platform. Look what the Lord has done. He's healed my body. He touched my mind. He saved me just in time and I'm going to praise Him. His, His name love is just the same. same. Oh, come, come on and praise, praise Him. Just look what, look what the Lord oh. But you're not worshiping. No. That ain't worship. No. Worship is where you say, you're going to heal me right now, Jesus. You're going to touch me right now, Lord. I want the prayer warriors get up here right now. Hurry, hurry, hurry. We're about to see some miracles take place in this place. As we sing this again and you're ready for God to put that miracle in your life, you're ready to get out of Egypt, you're ready to go to the promised land. You're ready to understand that God has blessings for you. He's got healing for you. He's got anointing for you. I want you to sing it with us. Worship with us. We're going to do it again. Come on right now. Let these folks pray for you. Why don't you look, look what, what the Lord has done. Yeah. Look, look what the Lord has done. Oh, yeah. He, he healed my body. He, he touched, touched my mind.
Somebody shout hallelujah. If you're ready to be baptized, all your sins washed away, you're going to come up out of that water with a new heart, a new life, a new body. I encourage you right now to head right over there where it says baptism. I have decided. Water's warm. People are waiting. If you're ready for your miracle, we're ready to get it with you. We call on you now. In Jesus' name.